Hello everyone, how's things? I hope you're doing very well. Uh, I'm Dave, this is Legends of the Spire and this is the podcast where I speak to the former players and managers of Chesterfield Football Club. Now it's episode number 41 today in which I'm speaking to Chris Tingey. Uh, now Chris was a youth player at Chesterfield ever since he was 10 years old uh, under the tutelage of Mark Jules and Dave Bentley uh, in that era when we had people like Craig Clay and Tendai Dariqua come through the youth ranks. He then got a six month professional contract with Chesterfield around about the 2009-10 season when we were moving stadium. Uh, so it was really interesting to have a chat with him about his experiences of going from the youth system through to getting a professional contract. Uh, unfortunately at that time, injury also struck. So his six month contract uh, wasn't renewed. And he also had some pretty rubbish experiences with a Scottish assistant manager to John Sheridan at the time too, uh, which I'm really thankful he was really honest about. It's good to um, hear about things that happened around then. Um, as always, we are at Spire Legends on uh, Twitter and Instagram, Legends of the Spire on Facebook. And it'd be also great if you check out our Etsy page, just go to etsy, etsy.co.uk and search for Legends of the Spire. I still have some of the amazing 1994-95 scarves left, uh, of which all the money is going to Tony Lormer's Brightside CIC, which is Tony Lormer's lymphoma support group. So a great cause. Uh, do go and get them, £15 and you get a signed print from him too. Uh, but here we are with the latest episode of Legends of the Spire with Chris Tingey. born uh so born early 90s so were you at Chesterfield from really young weren't you yeah so 1991 yeah so um lived down the road from Saltergate so from Ashgate near lived at the back of Ashgate Cross School um huge Chesterfield fans from being young my dad had taken me to the games um from being three or four years old in the cop he used to sit me on when they used to have the yellow bars, you know, in the cop years ago. So he used to, before I could really walk, sit me on there and like hold me, going to watch all the games and stuff. Um, I think I joined Chesterfield. I think they, they pretty much may have started the Centre of Excellence. I think I was 10. Mm -hmm. So from under 10s um, all the way through, really. So do you remember any of those kind of key moments in the 90s then, such as like FA Cup runs as far as you were really young? Right? Yeah, you know what, like when, when you really think about it, like you can kind of little images crop up, you know, like the old Trafford one. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know why it sticks in my mind, but I remember my auntie uh, who was stood next to me was like screaming uh, as towards the end of the game when Julesy was running down the left with the ball. I don't know why that comes to mind. Um but yeah, like there's pictures of me with my dad when the the Berry game, you know, the playoff game, like a couple of years before or the year before. There's a picture of me there, but I don't really have much memory of that. But my first memory of going to games is probably stood in when you used to be able to go in the away end when it was Nicky Law's team, when there was Luke Beckett and David Reeves up front. That was like my first proper memories of going to the games. But we used to have season tickets every year, um, pretty much until it was like 15, 16. Also, who were your who were the players that you first really liked then? Because were you a defender? I got that right. Yeah, yeah, I played um, all the way all the way through uh, playing from under tens up. I was pretty much playing centre back, or when it was like seven aside as a defender. And then when I was sixteen, moving into youth team, I moved to right back or played centre midfield. Um, yeah, so like I remember going when I used to go to the hairdressers as a kid. I used to ask for the Kevin Davis haircut. Whatever that meant. So I think it was the quiff, you know, like yeah, yeah. Quiff. Um, but yeah, I remember David Reeves obviously was a big player back then, wasn't he? And Lou Beckett for that year. Um, and then he always used to get a couple of wingers on loan. Like I always remember like Jamal Campbell Rice when he first came and he used to just get excited, you know, because some that that time it was always kind of like relegation, wasn't it? With Chesterfield, like trying to stay up in League One. Um, and then they used to get like a winger in, like Jamal Campbell Rice or Kevin Hurst or someone like that. And he used to like get excited, like going to watch the games. So very 4-4-2, wasn't it? 
Yeah, very rigid. Defend if we get a goal, you know, sit back, fall back, two banks of four. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I miss that in some ways, though. If I ever play things like football manager, I'm always like big man, little man up front. <laughs> yeah, yeah, big ball up to six foot crouch up front. <laughs> So you say you're about 10. So that was when everything was kind of going off, wasn't it? Was that kind of Darren Brown kind of? Yeah, yeah, pro- yeah it would have been, wouldn't it? I remember, uh, obviously, that time with the Nicky Law thing. I remember the songs in the stand, you know, about Darren Brown. And um, was it what was the guy's name that, from the paper? Ari Harris, was it or someone? And everyone in the stand used to sing them songs about them. So I remember that. Um and when I started there, I was at Sheff- I went to Sheffield United from about eight and nine. Um, and I had trials there. Um, up at their training ground, we played a game and I scored a couple of goals. And we thought, me and another lad who played for Somers- we played for Somersault Rangers at the time. Um, and we both went for trials up there and we thought we we're going to get signed um, by Sheffield United. But uh, they decided to sign all the lads from the previous year straight on. So then... I didn't really know what I was going to do because I played a year above myself for Somersault and they were moving to go in towards 11 a side at that time. And you weren't allowed to play a year above yourself for 11 a side for some reason. So um, so I went and played for a team called Britannia, who Jordan Burrow played for. Oh, okay. Jordan's, Jordan's my cousin. Oh, right, okay. so he obviously knew, knew my dad um, through marriage and stuff on my, on my, uh, on my dad's side. Um, so he got me to go and play for there, and Jordan was playing with Chesterfield at the time, so he got me um, got me a trial. So then I went down Chesterfield and got signed. So they didn't used to play games then for Chesterfield. They used to play for like a Sunday team. So I used to go train with Chesterfield, and then it was only a couple of years later you started playing the games for them. Um, but yeah, so I played. Obviously, everyone probably knows of Jordan. Um, so I played with Jordan from being like a young kid. He's done all right for himself, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah, he really has. I mean, I look at and we kind of had the same situation at Chesterfield, you know, when we both got signed pro and he kind of, he did the right thing and carried on, you know, and like stuck with it and he went up a league, didn't he actually, after he got released, you know, so he's done done really well for himself. Yeah, definitely. So what at what point then do you kind of start to become ball boy and, and stuff like that? Because if you're there from 10, I'd imagine you don't do any of that stuff until you kind of... No, like no, it was... Yeah, I don't. I think well, I'd probably under 16s. We used to do a bit of ball boying. Um, it was mostly the in the youth team would do all the ball boying around the stand, and used to kind of yeah, obviously with your different jobs that you had when you was in the youth team, certain people would always have to ball boy. Like the goalies would have to ball boy behind the net. So the the two goalies used to argue on who'd do the away end. <laughs> or who'd be over like Compton side, you know, because the gap between the stand, you'd be, if it were raining, you'd get soaked. <laughs> so uh, I remember the worst one was the, that that Droylston one that everyone goes on about in the FA Cup. It was chucking it down and I had to ball boy over the Compton side and I had me hood up and that. And it was just, do you remember Jack scoring that goal? And I was just sat there with my hood up and just drenched like, it's horrendous. <laughs> I mean, Droylston didn't have a, a large amount of fans, but did you? When Jack scored that goal, it was it was quite feisty, wasn't it? Yeah, I remember that. I remember their captain guy, who looked huge, obviously to me at the time, was only like sixteen, and going and grabbing Jack, and it was all kicking off. And but we we that was kind of like Jack's character to do something like that, you know. Like whether he meant to do it or not, you know, but I, he probably probably did. Like, just thought I'll just chip him, you know. <laughs> but yeah, it was it was a feisty. I think their fans were quite like aggressive as well, weren't they? So, mm. I think uh, it was. I think it was uh, Matt Malik was probably doing the away in that game, and I think he was getting some stick from their fans. And I've had uh, like a few players that have come through youth system before that talked about having to like go to Linda's and take all the orders and go <laughs> yeah. the players and all that stuff. Yeah. I imagine, did you do a bit of that? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you, sometimes, sometimes you would want to get the, the orders from the, the managers and stuff because they give you a couple of quid to get your own. But sometimes you're trying to avoid them because you're like, Oh, what if I get it wrong? I don't want to go down and, and do it, you know? <laughs> so um, I remember like John Sheridan and Tommy Wright and, Mark Crossley, 
sometimes would give you the orders to go down Linda's or there was a different, I can't remember the name of it. It was not Linda's way, it was the other way past um, Chesterfield Arms. It was opposite there, Do you know, on that road, there was a sandwich shop there. I can't remember the name of it. Sometimes they'd go there, but Linda's, it was always um, Chinese chicken, Chinese chicken with beetroot. I think that was, was that Phil Pickens, Joyce? Yeah, it could have been. Yeah, Phil Jordan Bowery got me into that <laughs> Chinese chicken. <laughs> yeah, it was like some pink. I've never, I've never ever seen it anywhere else I've ever been in a sandwich shop, Chinese chicken. But you always see coronation chicken or something, but it was like Chinese chicken with like beetroot and mayo or something, which probably wasn't the best like sandwich to have. But <laughs> <laughs> and like I think when Jamie Lowry was on, he was talking about how there was a lot of cleaning of the stands and the dressing rooms and all that stuff yeah. well to get. And he was like, you'd start it and then you'd finish it and it'd look exactly the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That like dilapidated and stuff be leaking and yeah, getting to the end of its life, wasn't it? That that ground. Oh, I yeah, there wasn't that much you could do with it. Um, luckily, I wasn't one of the one of the lads who was on the changing rooms. Um, I was on equipment with a couple of the other lads. I think was it Jimmy? Jimmy Adcock was on it with me. From we were the same age, um, so we had to look after all the balls, cones poles you know anything that they'd use for training bibs so um so probably one of the most important jobs you know that make sure the balls are pumped and if if one of the balls was a bit flat and in training the one of the management team would be straight over jimmy tingy over here and then you get a bollocking about it <laughs> um the worst it was worse in winter obviously because you've got all the bibs and everyone's training the mud up at cylinders or at warminster in sheffield and the bibs are soaked and the muddy, so you'd have to go and wash them. And then you make you have to clean all the balls, so you spend all afternoon cleaning the balls and the cones and the poles. So yeah, that was that was my main job. And then obviously you had your own pro who you do the boots for as well. And um, so I was quite lucky in my first year, as I had uh, Ben Algar. Obviously, I played with Ben from under 16s when I was playing in the youth team stuff. So I played with Ben, and I was quite friendly with him. So I was quite lucky on that part where it was quite like good with me. Do you know if like some of the lads had to like clean the laces of like the players' boots and everything? And but I was quite I was quite good with Ben. So I give him like if he asked me to do something, I felt like I could give him a bit of banter back because we were quite young, do you know. So and some of the lads who had like Jack or the like older pros, uh, Derek Niven and that were like I remember Ross Burns had Derek Niven. And then um, one of the training sessions, he Derek Niven obviously used to, old school player, used to wear World Cup boots, so he'd have to be like polish them, you know, polish them and that. And he brought up one, one right foot was molds and left foot was studs. So he brought like one one stud and one mold, and Derek Niven was fuming at him. And it was like, it's unacceptable, Burnsy, it's unacceptable. And all the lads are killing themselves. <laughs> but it's good times, like some of the stories that you think of, you know, when you're doing stuff like this now, just chatting to you, some of the like, best times. Like, I mean, It's funny, this, that when I talk to all these footballers, they talk about how they weren't pampered and, and stuff like that. It kind of no. sounds a bit, a, a bit like they were, a little bit. <laughs> 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 yeah they got looked after you know if you had a good apprentice but at Christmas you always did it because at Christmas you were you want you wanted a tip you know from them so some of the lads who obviously I'd like think Jordan Bowery I'd like Jack Lester and Jamie Ward so like it's probably two of the biggest earners at the club and the best players so he's like at Christmas getting like a decent tip and I've been Algar and I was like oh, we're gonna get from Ben you know I think he bought me a bought me a polo I think like a Lyle and Scott polo and give me 20 quid or something <laughs> And Jordan probably got Jordan probably got a few hundred, you know. Expecting <laughs> like a, a bag of quality street or something. Yeah, a bit <laughs> of like chocolates that. and that, you know. <laughs> so you're like youth team coaches then. So it was kind of Mark Jules era, wasn't it? Yeah, Julesy and Dave Bentley. So I had them two were pretty much my coaches all the way through, being from under tens, really. I think when I first joined, Dave was there, but it was a guy called Jonathan Pepper who when I think Nicky Law took him to Bradford with him mm -hmm. when he went to Bradford. So I think Julesy might have come in around that time. But yeah, I had Dave from like being a kid, you know, so I had Dave all the way through like nine, nine years, eight, nine years. 
So obviously you build up a relationship and he knows you inside out and knows what you're good at. You know, as a kid, I was probably not the best player. I was a bit podgy, you know, I was, I was all right. A player, a good defender, but I was a bit podgy. And then when you reach a certain age of puberty and that, and you start to grow, mm. um, I nearly got released, I think. It's probably under 12s, 13s. Um, and they basically said, like, he needs to, like, grow and needs to lose a bit of weight. So my dad took me to Chesterfield Athletics Club through the summer and used to go twice a week running. And it kind of changed my body just through the summer, going twice a week and running with people who did athletics, sprinting, doing a bit of sprinting, training, how to run properly, do you know, that sort of thing. Because as your kid, you might be a bit, your balance and everything might be a bit off. So, like, I worked through the summer and I carried that on all the way through. Um, and then I went, used to go to a speed agility and quickness training in Nottingham with a few of the other lads who were from Nottingham. Um, doing all kind of like ladder work and sprinting with parachutes on and that sort of thing to try and change me. And I kind of, as I grew, I kind of like got into my body. So I didn't put much more weight on. I kind of just grew up. And Dave, I remember him saying, when I come back one summer, like, have you been studying a grow bag all summer? Do you know, and I just, ch- just changed me. So I come back fit and like went from there and kind of pushed on from under 14s up. I think I just like was one of the best players in the team. It's funny, really, isn't it? Because there's things you can't control as the way yeah. you're, when you're a teenager. You know, you do kind of stretch into your body, don't you? At, at some yeah, point, exactly. Rates. It's it's difficult. Yeah. There's things you can't really control. Yeah, and it, I think it happens with kind of young lads who get pro contracts as well with the development. You have that stage of growth, don't you? But then you also have an, probably another stage when you reach 21, 22, where you kind of fill out a bit, you know, the muscle and that kind of comes along. So... It's kind of good to see that they give kids a bit more of a chance, you know, to develop at that age now. Yeah. What's well, I suppose people like Dave Bentley and that then kind of become quite pivotal people in your life, I suppose, when you spend oh, so much yeah. time with them when you're yeah. like developing as a person. Yeah, definitely. Um, yes, I mean, you train, in, you train every Tuesday, Wednesday up at Asland uh, Community School on the AstroTurfs up there from being that age. Um, and then obviously you have your own kind of coaches at each level and they normally would change each year as you move up because they kind of would stick to their own age groups um, and you're more or less with the same players. Uh, I think most of most of the lads who I played with in the youth team at my age were probably with the team from being 12, 13. We had a really good group and we were probably the best, one of the best age groups all the way through and Dave would always make an effort to like on a Sunday when you've got all the age groups playing, he'd spend a lot of time watching us, you know, and giving stuff at the on the side and that. Um so yeah, and I think it kind of showed probably when at that second year when five of us got pro contracts, you know, out of the team, more probably could have got them, do you know, the some really good lads who probably didn't get them, um, who went on to even do go a few lads went to play in America and stuff, you know, and did quite well. Um, so yeah, we're a really good age group and you make friends for life, you know, growing up yeah. together. Probably when you reach probably 15, kind of 16, when 16, I remember starting because Jules he would take the under 16s. So it was, he probably would take that so he could potentially see anyone who could move up, you know, to play in the youth team potentially at that age. So at that age, there was like Clay, Clay would go up, Craig Clay would go up and play in the youth team quite often. Uh, I used to go up a couple of times. Um, I think Ryan might have gone, Ryan Granger might have gone up and played a couple of games. Um, so I we played in a game Carlisle away um, in the FA Youth Cup. I think they had a few injuries and stuff. Uh, and I think that was my first big game. We played at Carlisle's game when I was 16. And so I went up there on the bus, you know, and you with the youth team and stuff and you were like, oh, my God, walking out like it felt like a professional game. You know, there was a few people in the stand and stuff Um, did really well and managed to kind of play, probably played seven or eight games as an under 16, you know, with the youth team. And then I was on the bench quite often as well. So from then on, you think, oh, I'm actually Dave likes me, Jules, he likes me, you know, so I've got a chance to get in the apprenticeship here. So if I can try and kick on again. When I get into the youth team, then you never know. So, so then it goes to kind of does it go to like first 
um, first year scholar, second year scholar, was it? Yeah, was yeah. Like- I know, I know Jamie when he was there, Lowry, they did three years, but I think it must have been a couple of years before us, they moved it to two. Um, yeah, so from that year, we all, as an under 16 team, um, used to go and meet Dave and Julesy like at the end of the year and they'd tell you whether you got a scholarship or not, basically. And it was like, you still, even though you've done well, you're still quite nervous because you don't know. You think, oh, who's who's in the year above me in my position? Or do you know, like I don't I don't know. And I was lucky enough to get one. And from our team, I think when we moved into first year scholars, there's probably seven out of the starting eleven for that youth team was first year scholars. So we had a really good year. And that was the year we won the league. Yeah. As a youth team. So we had a really good team. What was the uh can you remember like a, a one to eleven then of the of the basic team that we had around then? Of the first team or yeah. of, of the uh of, of your team that you were playing in that, that the youth was, team. Yeah. I so, well the first when we were in the first year, you had uh Matt Malik played in net, so he got Malik got a pro for six months. Um I played right back, and then you had um Burnsy, Rich, Ross Burns and Richie Holmes, centre backs, and Ryan Granger played left back. And then midfield, you had Craig Clay and Tendai, um, Sam Smith on the right, Jimmy Adcock on the left, and then um Jordan Bowery played up front with a lad called Adam Smith. And that, that was like the probably the most played teams, a few changes at every now and again in it, but that was probably the team that we won the league with. Do you know, we would like the best players at the time. Um, so, yeah, we did, we did really well um, that year and topped it off. We had to win on the last game of the season to, to win the league at York. And um, so we're all nervous and stuff. And Jordan Barris scored a hat-trick. So we were like happy days and celebrated that night. It was a great night. And then you have to, and then you get to do the kind of walk around the pitch, don't you, on like the... Last game of the season. The yeah, and it was Salt. Yeah, it was at Salt Gate. I remember. So they, they invited all his family and friends came, and they kind of put them over the other side of the Compton end towards the away end. So we all got presented with the trophy, and I'd walk around the pitch. And I remember some of the first team players were trying to ping balls at us as we were walking around. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, it was it was amazing. It's probably like. I've still got the medal now and I've one of the only like as a kid, obviously you get all the trophies when you play Sunday League and that it's probably like the most cherished medal I've got, Do you know, I I brought over with me to his house over in Ireland now. Um it's a big achievement, Do you know, it's it's probably like not many kids who are even pros now have, have maybe say that they've won like a, a league with the youth team, Do you know, and we had Hull City were in the in our, I think they'd probably just been promoted to the Prem. And they were in our league at the time, so they were like the biggest rivals. And I think we may have beat them twice that year, you know, so we just had such a good team. As Chesterfield look to get this FA Youth Cup first round tie underway, kicking from right to left in their traditional blue tops, white shorts and blue stockings. Mansfield again in their uh, usual amber shirts, blue shorts, and Amber Socks. And here we go. We expect a bit of blood, guts, and certainly thunder. And already inside the opening 10 seconds, Chesterfield have put the ball into the back of the net. Chesterfield out of the starting blocks like an Olympic sprinter. And on seven seconds, they draw first blood in the derby. Yeah. So take me, th- take me through like a week in the life of like a, a first or second year scholar then? Yeah. Um, so you used to have to be there at nine o'clock, Salt Lake Gate. So I'd be walk. I used to walk up from home for Ashgate Croft all the way up Ashgate Road, you know, up the hill and that. Um, sometimes Julesy would be coming from Manchester or way and he'd drive past me and pick me up. I used to get a lift and some of the lads had seen me come in with him sometimes. I'd be like, oh God, dude, like, here we go. So he's calling is your dad or whatever and that. And, <laughs> you know, coming in with the manager. Um, see him for nine o'clock. And then it's basically getting your jobs ready for make sure you, the boots are clean. If there's been, if it's a Monday and there's been a game at the weekend, all the kit would be there. So the lads who were on kit would have to go out and sort all the kit. Um we as a, as on equipment, we used to um, take it in turns, go 
knocking on Nudge's door and speaking to Shinna and asking Shinna what equipment he needed um, for that day. Um, obviously, as a kid, you're quite scared of Shinna because obviously he's a big guy, you know, he's an absolute animal, you know. <laughs> and, um, so he used to, like, take it in turns, like, you go and ask him, no, you go and ask him, and whoever lost, like, go and ask Shinna and get all the equipment ready, um, take it up to training in the minibus, set it all up for them. Uh, do your own training and then clear up after the first team have done their training, uh, head back, all the jobs in the afternoon, changing rooms, um, stands. If you were lucky and you didn't have to run in the afternoon, um, you go and get your dinner and you'd just be rushing to try and get the, the jobs done, you know, all day. Mm. Um, so you could get home and you probably finished on average at like three o'clock, three, four o'clock, if you were lucky. Or when Dave, sometimes you'd be finished and he'd like leave you another hour just sat in the changing rooms for like a bit of team bonding just to chat and some of the lads want to get back to Nottingham on the train mm. um Wednesdays you used to go to college so you used to have to go down to Chesterfield College to do your course um first year on a Wednesday we had to go up to Clown so we had to be down at Chesterfield College for like eight to catch the bus which for the lads coming from Nottingham was a bit of a nightmare so they'd all turn up like zombies you know on the on the bus in the morning and um, go up to clown to do your lessons and that and the teachers there were actually like pretty good with you you know because they knew you were you didn't you, you didn't really want to be there you know like you don't want to go to college you know but it's it's actually good for you because if I didn't do that I probably wouldn't have got into university mm. so it's it's good to do that um, and you had one of our tutors was Dave Rushbury, you know, like one of the old managers. Yeah. He was one of our tutors up at Clown, so he used to tell you all stories about the times. He didn't really like teach you much. He used to give you assignments and that, but he just used to come and chat to you like about um, about old stories or when he was managing or when he was physio and that. And he used to pick his ear about like the FA Cup and stuff. Um, yeah, and then Thursday you used to do half a day at college. You used to do the morning at training. And then when you get back, you had to get ready and go down to college for half a day. And then Friday, same again, really, but you're kind of preparing for your own game on the Saturday. Um, and then if the first team was at home on the Saturday, you'd play your game in the morning, probably 11 o'clock kickoff, and then you'd be back to Saltergate for the game and you'd have to do your jobs, whether that was ball boy and stuff. So you do quite a lot, you know, and when you think about it. Imagine that some of the... Youth teams nowadays don't do half of what we had to do. Yeah. And was it 2009 you got your pro contract? It was around then? Yeah. Yeah. Probably around that time, isn't it? Yeah. It was John Sheridan's, end of John Sheridan's first year. Um, first year was there was Lee Richardson um, and Scott Sellers. Um, and they, it was I, I really like Lee Richardson and Scott Sellers. Scott Sellers was amazing with the young kids. You know, I, I think he's, I think he was at Chef United before he came to Chesterfield, wasn't he? He's like the youth team manager. So he was really involved with the kids and he used to take us down to um, Queen's Park to play on the AstroTurf, five aside sometimes. Him and Shinny used to come down and join in. And Scott Sellers would be like nutmegging people and like taking the mix. He was, he was unbelievable. Obviously, he's a player, wasn't he, years ago? Um, but he was really good. And Lee Richardson really liked me. Um, I used to, I used to train with the first team like quite often and play in eleven aside games and stuff. Um, so when when he went, obviously I was a little bit gutted because you think oh, the first team manager quite likes me and I'm training with them and playing in eleven aside games and stuff. So um, and then yeah, John Sheridan came in, um, and I was still training with the first team obviously because. He obviously get information from Dave and Julesy about the young lads, and he watch us in training and stuff. So that year, like me and Clay would train with the first team quite often, and Tendai um, would go over and train, and it would always be on the bus on the way up to Warminster. Julesy or whoever was driving the bus would wait till you got up to the Warminster training ground or cylinders, and would shout to the back of the bus, say Clay Tingy with the first team today, and all the youth team lads would be like, way like it was like like you didn't want to go and train with them do you know that sort of thing it was like oh but in a way it's like you it's good that you're training with them yeah. you know but it was like a thing where you're a bit nervous obviously going to train with them do you, when when you're playing in like an 11 side against all those teams do you and you're like a defender mm -hmm. do you feel like you can 
fling yourself into a tackle against some of these players. <laughs> <laughs> I know, yeah. I think when he's the first year when um he was doing eleven sides, they used to play Jamie Ward like on the left, and I play right back. So I was playing against Wardy and I was just like trying to chase him down, you know, and I you never like I would never have like flew myself in because I, I, I probably at that age as a fan as well, you like I don't want to injure anyone here, do you know, where some of the other lads might have been a bit more like get in there, do you know, and make your presence known. But no, I, I probably kind of stood off a little bit on that kind of thing, like flying into tackles and stuff. Um, but it wasn't like that probably wasn't my game anyway of kind of I was probably more technical um, of like I used to get up and down from right back quite a lot and putting crosses in and stuff mm. um, didn't mind tackling or anything but it was probably probably wasn't the best side of my game defending I was probably more of attacking fullback really yeah so you obviously got a contract with quite a few others <laughs> yeah was it like a six month contract something like that uh, I had the knee injury um, halfway through the season as a second year scholar. Um, I did my, my medial ligament um, and uh, damaged my cartilage in the inside of my knee. And when I did it, Mark Mullins was the physio and he thought I'd done my ACL um, because like within like 10 seconds of doing it, my knees was massive, just swollen up. It was huge, and I couldn't bend it. I couldn't do anything. It was hor- horrible. Um, I think I like I like went into a divot in the ground, and my knee just kind of collapsed inwards. So that's probably why I did my medial in the inside of my knee. Um, so yeah, so I got injured, and I didn't play. Obviously, the rest of the season, I had operation on it, um, fixed the damage or whatever, and I was kind of on crutches probably for like four months, maybe. Um, and then it was kind of a whole thing of trying to like straighten your knee again and trying to first get back putting weight on it and walking and then trying to strengthen your leg up again. So obviously all the, I'd never really had an injury up until that point. I've been quite lucky. I'd had little niggly things, you know, where you might twist your ankle or something, but never something as serious as that. Um, so I was quite lucky. So through them two year and a half as a scholar, I built up a bit of strength. You know, you obviously work with Shinner in afternoons and have you running around running around Saltergate on the track and then up, up and down the stands, you know, so you're kind of into that 18, getting 18 years old, you're building a bit of strength up in your legs and that. And then I just completely lost that in one leg because I couldn't put any weight on it for four months. Yeah. So luckily enough, I got the chance, you know, I remember going in at the end of the season and again, I, I knew I was a good player and I could technically, I was, I thought I was like one of the best players in the youth team technically, you know, um yeah, so I was I was lucky enough to get the six months and he said to me, do you know, like work and get yourself back fit, you know, and just give it, give it a real go when you come back in the summer. Um yeah, so I probably that was probably 2009, looking back, yeah, last season at Saltergate. It's I mean, I imagine that when you're that age, you're you're in like a rush all the time mm. to like yeah. be better and be a footballer and stuff like that. And when an injury like that comes along everything stops doesn't it and you can't can't really yeah. do about it I yeah. it must be how do you kind of get you how do you get yourself out of that hole when you when something like that happens I don't know I, I still have issues with it now <laughs> like like I've since I've played a little bit semi-pro and stuff since leaving Chesterfield and after a game still be in pain with it you know I, I do a lot of running now running marathons and things and it's just something you kind of deal with you know as, as like part of life you know especially when it's cold as well when it's cold like your knees are killing me um but at the time obviously never really had an injury so I didn't really know the process of rehab and how how hard you need to work to come out of it and get yourself back to where you were before and probably like your confidence as well has gone and um, so when I came came back in the summer I probably looking back now I was kind of left a little bit to my own devices through the summer I'd had physio I would used to go and see Mark Bones a couple of times a week and stuff and used to go down to the gym and fitness first most days during the summer and um, but it still wasn't right and um, I'd be doing all the leg weights and stuff. I'd still be getting a bit of pain. I'd be running on it. Um, and then I come back for pre-season and um, 
was it wasn't just wasn't right so I was trying to keep up with everybody running and it was kind of like I was hobbling while I was running all the time and some of the first team pros were like are you okay like you don't you don't look right I remember Gregor Robertson because he I don't think no he wouldn't have broken his leg at the time I think it was that season he broke his leg um but he was like you just don't look you don't look right um so I was back in the physio room all the time um and just trying to like basically I was with Shinner or in the in the gym for most of my six months trying to get fit again was there ever the temptation then to try and because I, I imagine you've you come back from injury you can almost train like too hard because you want to catch up again yeah was there ever like the temptation there as well to just kind of not say anything about it and just try and <laughs> try and get yeah or, or, yeah because you know I was obviously except I'm not in my second year I played a lot of like first kind of friendlies first team played at Sheffield FC and played at a few other games you know in the friendlies uh, when they didn't have the first first team out and I was probably playing like three games a week and with the youth team and then a couple of first team games so I was in and around that from that start of the second year I was in around the first team and then you know you start to come into your own a little bit and you're getting confidence and there's a bit of talk about you you know doing well uh, my dad always used to read Bob's board, you know, on the on the internet. Chesterfield is a big fan, and sometimes my name would crop up, you know, was doing well and that, and he'd be buzzing, you know, like, oh, they're talking about you on here. And then you get an injury, and it's like all stops. You know, you can't do anything, and it was just like, yeah, it was. It's hard, really mentally, it's really hard. So your um, time when you were with kind of. First team squad then, so was that last season at Saltgate? Uh, no, it did the first, first season, season in the season. in the new yeah. stadium. Yeah, yeah the first yeah. So that the last season at Saltgate was my second year mm. as a set as a scholar, and then as a when I got my pro, they moved into the into the new stadium. Um, yeah, I played. I think I played one maybe one reserve game on it towards the end of that six months. Um, but you'd obviously be in, in the stands watching the games all the time. So it was a big move from going from Saltergate, you know, down to a new, this new stadium, you know, it was awesome. And the crowds obviously went up and, and um, yeah, it was, it was great. It's really good. So then you ended up uh, kind of getting released, didn't you? So yeah. How did that all kind of happen? Um, the last, the last, the last month. To be fair, I think I'd, I'd worked. Like Sh- Shinner was brilliant with me. I know people like don't talk highly enough of him. He's an unbelievable guy, you know. And like, no, there's no messing with him. You know, it's kind of like you work, work your ass off when you're with. Him. And he'd have all the injured lads most afternoons, and some of the younger lads in the gym. And he'd work you till you'd pretty much collapse. You know, I did that for like four or five months. So I was getting my strength back, you know, and I was like getting getting a lot fitter. Um, and then I played, started playing in a few reserve games again. Um, played at Notts County, I think, and then played a couple at home. Um, can't remember who we played at home. I think Matt played Leicester, one of the games. And I remember Norm, Mark Crossley, came to me and was like, you're looking a lot better, do you know? You're looking fitter again. You're looking like how you were before. And I said, yeah, I feel, I feel like I'm coming along. Do you know, I was work, pretty much worked my ass off, do you know, to all that six months to give my, try and give myself a chance, like twice a day, do you know, training and in the gym and running and like really hard work and use knackered. Um, but I tried to give myself the best chance I could. So I knew it'd be difficult as well, do you know, because only on six, you're getting a six month deal and you come in for five months injured, it's going to be tough, isn't it? Do you know, to try and make your mark at all. Um, so I remember I actually got called up to do, they were doing like a like a press conference sort of thing upstairs with some of the players where people from the media could ask. And I got called up to do it. And I was like, oh, really? I was like, right, okay. And a few of the other lads. And then um, I remember Phil Tooley asked, asked me a question. It was like, Chris, you've been injured. Like, how are you feeling? Are you like, Phil was always a really good fan of mine. Mm. Um, whenever I was in the youth team and stuff, he'd always like come and chat to me. And um, he used to ask me if I was related to Phil Tingey, who used to be like one of the goalies at Chesterfield. Um, uh, although I'm not related. I don't think I'm related to Phil anyway. Maybe a distant relation because I don't think there's many Tingies around. Is there really? <laughs> 
But um, yeah, so I was doing like this press conference thing and asking me how I was. And I was like, yeah, I've like played a few games coming back. And then the um, assistant manager, Tommy Wright, called me and says, oh, Gaffer wants to see you. And then I went down to see John Sheridan and he just said like, look, um, the chairman's only letting me have uh, so many players on the on the on the team do you know like 25 or whatever and I want to bring certain players in so we're kind of just gonna to have to let you go and that was kind of it <laughs> so how do you I don't know how do you kind of react to that because it's yeah probably not well um do you know being being at the club do you know from 10 I was gutted do you know I probably just like went home I, I think I I didn't drive at the time, so I used to have to get the bus into town and then down. So I think I just started going home and my dad came and got me on his way home from work and was like, like, don't worry, do you want me to go in and chat to him or something? Do you know, do you want to go and talk and find out why and stuff? I was like, no, dad, just leave it. It's, do you know, I'd like worked hard, you know, try and come back, but it wasn't meant to be. So, yeah, kind of from there, just kind of, you probably hit rock bottom, don't you? You know, you've, you're great, you're playing for your your hometown club who you've supported all your life and then things don't go well for you and you've kind of worked hard to try and come back and then you get released and you're just like, what can you do? Yeah, and, and I've spoken to a lot of players that have played that have had like 10, 15-year careers that have then had to retire because of injury or stuff like that and they all talk about how, you know, didn't watch football for six months, yeah. just in it, just didn't want to sick of the sight of it. yeah. Was that kind of like it with you as well? 100%. Yeah, I totally fell out of love with it. Even I think even probably watching like Premier League games, you know, on Sky and stuff, wasn't bothered. Mm. Wasn't bothered. I just, like, I remember probably a couple of days after I finished, um, I got was getting phone calls from people. So I got a phone call from, um, I don't know if they were like a football agency or something, but they used to like, lads who got released used to go over to like Sweden or Iceland, places like that to go and play. And I got offered to go and like actually sign for a team in Sweden. They must have rang the club and maybe they've like given me a good reference, you know, say he's a good lad, he just needs to play. And I just wasn't interested. Just completely just fell out of love with it. As yeah, as looking back, it's like you could, if you knuckled down, you know, and just thought, right, you've got rejected. Like, but it's not the end of the world. It's one person's opinion of you, you know, at that time. And I don't think his opinion of me was bad. I think I always got, like, well with John Sheridan, one of the assistant managers that I too on too well with, um, to be fair. He was always on top and, like, probably call it bullying nowadays, um, how he was with some of the young lads. But John Sheridan was really good with me, and I don't think he had a bad opinion of me. I just think it was probably bad timing for me with injuries and stuff. Yeah. So but yeah, just com- yeah, just completely kind of cut football out in my life, probably for a year, two years. Just not not interested. Played five aside with my friends now and again. Um and was going to the gym probably for my own mental health to try and keep fit a little bit. But like in terms of like going back to playing football and that, I was not interested at that time. So how so what did you end up what what kind of not shook you out of it, that's the wrong way to put it, but what kind of good mentally kind of turned you around then because you ended up going to university didn't you yeah so I think obviously like being injured and stuff you're not around the first team as much as what like the lads who are training every day are so I kind of didn't have that connection with a lot of the first team I talked to them like before training and stuff and around the place but when you're playing in a team and you're part of a, a team there's a different feeling you know with 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 lads and you make a better bigger connection because it's like you're all together and I really wasn't like part of that because I was always on the outside as an injured player and stuff and um so I kind of missed that and then when I got back training assistant manager was like he was he was I don't know he just used to be on your back all the time and I'd gone from like kind of it may be because it's like men's football and he's trying to test you, you know, as they say nowadays, when they get on your back, they're trying to test you. But it was like every day, all the time. And I don't think I reacted well to it at the time. It kind of got on my back a little bit and kind of got my back up. So it kind of like ruined a bit of the experience for me where I was kind of thinking in the morning, like I don't really want to go in. 
train as well because he's like getting on my back but you've worked so hard to get to this point like go in and work work hard so he used to just go in and get me a damn work um so when you get released it's kind of more of a knockback because you have worked hard and you've took criticism and you've took like being shouted at um quite a lot by him um yeah so it was I can, it was I can guess I can guess which guy it probably is if you're talking <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we could just, I don't, I don't, if we want to say names, I don't know if you want to say names, like, but it's a small guy, <laughs> I'll say, <laughs> yeah, he was, it was, I don't, he, I remember Drew Talbot said to me, um, when he could see, like, it was getting to me a little bit, and he says, have a go back at him, he says, have a go back at him, he says, he did it to me when he first came in, and I said, I'm not a kid anymore, like, you can't speak to me like that, and he didn't do it again. But when you're that when you're that age and you're just going into the first team, you don't you don't really no. want to like say anything back to you. You just kind of take it, you know. And it kind of just like I don't think I, some people might react well to that, but I don't think at the time that it was the right way maybe to speak to me or to mm. like motivate me, you know, to keep going. Really, um, I suppose there's still because like when I spoke to Paul Cook recently, he talked about how footballers from when he were playing. Mm. Uh, had to change because it was all very different back then and it's all very different now and it's like yeah. these people have to change but some people just can't change so I'm guessing yeah. there's, there's, there were still people <laughs> around the club when you were there but- yeah no it was like this it was kind of I don't I obviously don't I'm not in that environment anymore but I imagine it's quite different now you know but there was still kind of some parts would be that old school you know, where it was like give you give you a, a shouting out if you're not doing something or like I remember one one thing as, as a young lad you, I had my coat was left uh, at training and um, we were training on the pitch I think at B2 net and like obviously you're taking your coat off because you're getting warm after the warm-up and just left it on the side and I fin- finished training back in the changing room and coat and he comes in with it and he was like, looked at the number on it and seen it was me and walks up to me and throws it in my face and goes, do you think I'm like here to collect your stuff? You're fine. Like, I want my money tomorrow sort of thing. And as a kid, you're like, oh my God, you know? But it was like that kind of thing quite consistently with him. Mm. So, yeah, it was, but it was a tough time, but like it, it was even more gutting then because she got released because I'd come through all that, you know, and I'd like start training again. And once I started training, and playing in a couple of games, it kind of wore off that because they could see I was getting a bit better, I think, and I'd come through that time. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think it was just bad timing for me, really. So, so like you said, you went you went to university. So did you do, like, sports sports science? or? Something? Yeah, yeah, I did sports science at Liverpool Uni. Um, obviously, I, was, I think I was quite lucky to get on the course uh, when they asked for it, they asked for A-levels and, you know, all this kind of thing. And obviously, I hadn't done them to so gone straight into football, but I'd got the, uh, I think it was MBQ we did at college behind me. Um, so I was able, luckily enough, to get on the course and then had the first year in Liverpool, moved in the halls um, and um, probably all the stresses of the previous year were just, like, was out all the time. <laughs> and as if you want to be an athlete or whatever you can't really do that and I didn't really do it growing up you know that the odd time you go out and stuff with lads and that but like it was probably out in Liverpool big city you know I was not used to it lad from Chesterfield only probably been out in Sheffield or like before you know and go to Liverpool it's like wow everything here and he was just out all the time so first year was unreal a great time. <laughs> Liverpool's a great city, isn't it? It was on. Oh yeah, I love it. Like if I, if it was one place I'd move back to, do you know, it'd probably be Liverpool. Do you know, the people are so friendly. Do you know, like the taxi drivers talk to them about football all day. Hmm. Um, it was probably after that first year when, after the first finished first year at uni, and uh, come obviously come home for the summer back to Chesterfield. And Dave and Julesy had left Chesterfield. Uh, Paul Cook had come in. And I think he, I don't know if he just wanted to change the youth system and just change it up a bit. And they were doing some coaching. Uh, um, it was a new thing they done called SBLFC, they were called. It used to be on Brookfield. It was like trying to bring young lads who didn't have a chance to play like together again. So I went down and was helping them do some coaching with them through the summer. And um, 
I got speaking to, you know, Zach Brunt, who played Chef United. Oh, yeah. Zach was there training and stuff, speaking to Zach, and I got speaking to his dad. And his dad was like, why are you not playing anymore? And I just said, I kind of just fell out of love with it a little bit, but I might like want to get into it again. Um, so he says, oh, I'll, who, what level do you want to play at and stuff? So he said a few clubs, you know, around Liverpool, like semi-pro clubs. So he contacted um, Prescott Cables for me. And then that summer I went back to Liverpool and I was playing back playing semi-pro with Prescott Cables for that year. Um, and then through all my university and then living in Liverpool, I carried on playing semi-pro again. I kind of found a bit more of a love for it again. You know, I was obviously playing all the time and felt good. Um, so, yeah, I really enjoyed playing again, but it was kind of it was semi-pro. So it wasn't like glamorous or anything, you know, it was like muddy pitches and stuff, but like just like having a crack and then having a beer, you know, after the game, you know, with, with your mates, it was like, it was kind of like that. You know, so it was you weren't being paid or anything. It was just for the love of it again. So, so you mentioned. Uh, so, so what are you doing now? So, you, so you're in Northern Ireland, aren't you? Yeah. So, met, obviously, met me, um, my future wife, uh, be my wife in three weeks, getting married in three weeks, um, in Liverpool at uni. And obviously, Liverpool's full of Irish people, isn't it? You know, so uh, like, I didn't have much choice there uh, meeting an Irish girl. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I've been together 10 years now and four years ago, we moved over to Belfast. Um, so living over in Belfast now. Um, so since moving over here, I've worked in like health and social care for, for a few companies. Um, and then the start of last year, I set up my own um, care agency, supplies kind of nurses and carers to um, care homes and things like that. Kind of an interesting time to be doing things like that. Yeah, yeah, uh, probably probably helped a little bit with the business, you know, because the time you're in, you know, if you've got staff available, like the care homes and stuff are in need of people, you know, to go and work. It's probably, it took me probably a few years to kind of get over the, the disappointment of being released, you know, as, as not love, out of love with football. I kind of got back into football after a year, but with Chesterfield as a club, you know, I kind of got over the fact that I, I have supported them all my life, you know, and I'm from there. And it took me a couple of years. And then probably when Paul Cup came in the second year, I started going again. So I used to go home sometimes at weekends and watch the games um, and then went to all the playoff games, Preston won away. And that's obviously not too far from Liverpool. Um, and then I kind of obviously followed them from then and then the disappointment of them going down and now they look like on the way back up again. Do you know, I went, I managed luckily enough to get a ticket for the Chelsea game. Um, so I managed to get over to that, which was an un- unbelievable weekend. Um, but every game now, but all season, I've been listening to the 1866 uh, podcast, you know, Phil and that on the, on the games. Yeah. It was at the weekend there with the Barnet game. We took me little one to um, Dobby's to the indoor play area. And um, it was probably like half three and I already missed half an hour of the game. And uh, I was there with, with Shannon, my girlfriend, and Daniel's out playing in the thing. And I've got the podcast on. She's like, well, you turn that down. Everyone's looking. <laughs> but like I was like every every game now, I make sure that I listen to every game if I can't obviously make it to the games and stuff. But yeah, so I love like... Hopefully they go up this year, you know, and uh, they get back to where they should be. 